G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today I've got a quick tutorial that's actually been requested quite a lot recently, uh, which is why I've decided to include it in the middle of a series on PyRevit. Um, we will actually use the script in our next video in our PyRevit series, where we look at packaging a script up and putting it in the toolbar. But today's focus is revisiting an old topic, but with a bit of new context. So we're looking at using Dynamo to generate room finishes based on room boundaries and room data. The difference today is I'll be using a custom node from my package Crumple, which can actually handle floors with holes in them, not just floors with an outline sketch. The catch here is you will need to be using Revit 2022 or higher, where this API method has become exposed. Um, so without further ado, um, let's jump in and learn how to do it. So in this case, I'm dealing with the model set up in a fairly particular way to support the workflow. I will run quickly through how this has been done and this model will be available on GitHub as well. Um, in this case with the script, if you wish to follow along. So I have to set up a basic model with some rooms. Now it's important to note that one of these rooms has a hole in it, actually two of them do. Both these rooms have what I call a donut shape. Um, for people that know the Revit API well, they'll know that when creating a floor or a ceiling, which we couldn't do before at all, we weren't typically able to accommodate any additional loops inside here. We used to actually generate floor openings and host them to the floor. Pretty bad workaround. Um, now, due to changes in the Revit 2022 API, we can actually do this, and I have built some nodes that take advantage of this in my custom package crumple. What I have done is created three floor finish types, and it's important to note that these floor finishes do have a description that matches a floor finish field in a particular room. So I'm gonna be taking advantage of the matchability of this data. If you don't have any matchable data, this workflow won't really work. You'll have to build two explicit lists that are used for cross-matching instead. So I do recommend that being the first thing you do configure for this workflow to be successful. From here, we're gonna be using the room's finish boundary and all the rooms that we can see in the active view. So I'm just gonna jump into Dynamo and start building my workflow. So the first thing we are going to need in this case is all of our rooms in the active view. So I'm going to be looking for all elements of category in view. I'm going to get the category by name and I'm just going to set the name as rooms. It's always the same category so a drop down isn't required. I'm then looking for the active view in my current document. So I'm going to get a current document and an active view node. And when I hook these up, I should now have all the rooms visible in my current view. Now, this is a good way to collect all the rooms you can see. You are going to want to make sure that those rooms are also valid so that they do have a valid area. So you could always filter these rooms by whether they contain an area just to get rid of any unenclosed rooms because they will mess up the workflow if they do exist in the current view. Luckily, I've been modeling pretty carefully, so everything is valid. I'm also going to get their floor finish in this case. So I'm going to use the get parameter value by name node. And from these rooms, I'm going to ask them to return their floor finish as a parameter. And we should get these respective finishes. Now note that some of these are actually NA, not applicable. So in this case, I'm going to be matching these to the list of floor types. And we're going to detect that some of these floors don't actually have matching floor finish code. So we're going to filter them out on that basis. But now we actually need to get our floor types. So we actually need an element type to do this. Now, at the moment, this is an element type dropdown. For people that know how dropdowns work, um, each year there are more types that enter uh, this list of possibilities, what we call an enumeration. And as a result, potentially these dropdowns might not be the intended type in future versions. So I did actually build a node in my custom package crumple to deal with this. So under Revit, under element type, I'm gonna use the element type by name node which works a little bit like the category by name node. Now, I'm not sure if they might have actually implemented one of these in Revit, um, in Dynamo. I haven't actually checked for a while, but they might have. There we go, they have. It's cool. So you don't actually need my custom package for that. So, <laughs> but in earlier builds, that didn't exist. So we're going to go floor type as our element type. Now, interesting that in this case, that element type doesn't exist. Element type by name. Maybe it's looking actually through the types of elements, um, the literal types of elements instead. Because if I run that through my own, I get the equivalent element type. Quite interesting. I wonder if I make it floor. No, nope, still doesn't exist. Okay, so that node doesn't actually seem to work the way that mine does. Mine actually returns the equivalent element type from the RevitDB. 
So what I can do now is I can actually get all elements of type. So I guess, yeah, keep using my node. <laughs> it seems to work. And now we have all our floor types. From these, we're going to ask for a few different values. So I'm just going to borrow these two nodes up here. And I'm just going to copy this one. And what I'll do is just move this back here. And we're going to be asking this floor type for two parameters. So in this case, first of all, we want to check what is your description? Because we're going to use this to match to the floor type in the floor finish field. I'm also going to ask it what its default thickness is because we do need to offset this once we're finished uh, by the thickness. So I'm going to look for default thickness. Noting I'm writing in a code block here, so I can just connect one and the other. And I should have one list for the default thicknesses and another list for the types. Now some of these don't actually have a description, so they're just currently empty. I'm now just going to take these and move them down so I can carry my floor type over later. And at this point, we need to check, do these type names exist in the possible matchable floor types? So I'm going to use a list contains node. And I'm going to say, in this list of possible types, does this item exist? And we also need to say in this list at level two with longest lacing, because we're looking through a list that's occurring at the, the level two. And we can see that we find the cases where these don't exist. In, in this case, these are our NAs. So what we can do with these is filter them out of our floors that we're dealing with. So I'm gonna take my original floors, or my rooms, sorry, and I'm gonna filter. So now my in list contains my rooms with a valid floor finish code and the out list contains the ones without. So we can just proceed forward with our in list. I'm also just gonna use that same filter to the floor finish value as well, so that we can keep using this value in our next step. Because what we wanna do now is find out what value that floor finish represents as an element type. So I'm gonna use the index of node, and I'm now gonna be querying in this case, in my list of floor finish type values, where do each of those values occur? And we should get an index for each one. So I can see, for example, the first object in that list occurs at index two, and we can verify that saying that this object is carpet. But if we go back to the source list, I can see at index two, I have carpet. So that's the matching index. And because these line up to their original element type, we can use the get item at index node to say from the original list of floor types, get the floor type that represents that match. And now for each room, we have its equivalent floor type to be created. We also, in this case, need to verify the level to create the floors at. Now, of course, we could, in this case, just use the, the level of the view that we're in. That's probably quite safe in most cases. Or we could also get the level as, as a parameter value from the room. So in this case, I'm going to say from the rooms, we want to get the level value. Now, in this case, it's going to return the level's name, which isn't that useful. We actually want the level object instead. So what I can do is in my custom package crumple, I've made a node under Revit, under levels, level get by name. And from the current document, I'm gonna get that matching level. And now these are actually level elements, which is what we need. Finally, I'm gonna ask for the finish boundary of this particular room. So from these rooms, I'm gonna get their boundary and it's gonna return the curves in a very specific list structure. So in this case, we have a list of lists of lists of curves. So quite a few nesting of lists there, but we have one list which contains sublists per room and in that we have lists of curves, effectively representing each curve loop around the room itself. Now I've built my custom node to receive this specific list structure, so you don't have to do anything to it. The last thing we're gonna do is also get the corresponding default thickness from that same index of that floor type. So now we have the offset for the particular floor finishes that we're dealing with to apply to the floors to make sure they sit on top of the slabs. So the last thing we need is actually just one node. Um, so in this case, in Crumple, under Revit floors, we have floors by curve loops. So this is actually just one big Python script with a set parameter by name after it. So what the Python script is doing is it's doing all of its importing of libraries. It's defining a few functions. 
I'm firstly doing what's called padding of the list, um, or what I'm calling padding, which effectively forces all the inputs to behave like a longest lacing. So as soon as we run out of an item to source, we just pad it onto the end. So you can give it one floor type, you can give it one floor type per floor, you can give it one level, you can give it one level per floor. It accepts pretty flexible input structures because I recognize that sometimes you're not always gonna have the data in the rooms that you wish to populate. So you might be specifying one floor type per set of rooms at once. We can see that I pad all my inputs and effectively at this point, I'm just creating curve loops from the curves for the rooms. And then I'm finally creating a floor using each set of curve loops per room for the floor and the level. And at that point I'm done. And then I'm just using a longest lace set parameter by name outside the Python script to, in this case, apply either one offset or a longest lacing offset in this case. So what I can do with this node is firstly switch to manual mode. So I'm firstly gonna take my curve lists. I'm gonna take my floor types, my levels, and my offset. I'm now just going to minimize this. And if I run my script, we can see now we have floor finishes. I have my tiles, my timber, my carpet, and I also have my carpet with a hole in the middle successfully created. I can see that the rooms without a matching finish also did not get populated with a floor finish, which is perfect. Now the last thing we might wanna do is just set this up for Dynamo Player. Now actually at the moment, we don't actually have any inputs that are required for Dynamo Player. Um, what we could do is potentially add a optional uh, choice to offset the, 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 the rooms or not. So if I say if, and I use my if then else node from Crumple, I can just say either send through my list of offsets or send through nothing. So if I say true, I'm gonna offset them. Otherwise, um, I'm just gonna send it through zero. I'm going to make a boolean and I'm going to say that when it's true, I'm going to make an input. I'm going to say offset the floors. And then instead I replace this list with the offset. So when it's set to false, I'm going to end up instead with a zero and all these finishes are now going to be flush to the slab, which would be what you would do if you had say tiles um, that in this case are flush to a slab finish. I can see in this case, I've already placed them originally, so they are already gonna be placed with an offset. Um, if I do just delete these and rerun the script again, by saving it, I'll call it demo script. Reopening it going to a view where I can see the rooms, which is really important. Rerunning the script with the offset set to false. Now these should be sitting with an offset of zero, which they are. So we can say we've got at least one tunable input that typically wouldn't be available um, in, in Dynamo Player if it wasn't available um, in say a program like PyRevit. So in this case, um, I can actually run the script through Dynamo Player instead. It's a very simple Dynamo Player script, only one input, so I'm um, not super complicated. But I can see now if I go to level zero, and I make sure that these flaws don't exist. And I edit my inputs, I can say yes, offset the flaws, run the script, and now these should have the offset applied to sit flush to the slab surface itself. So it's a little bit of a more complicated version than the last time I built the script, but I hope it's a handy script. And again, I hope Crumple is a useful package for people um, looking for fairly practical nodes that do quite common tasks that we need them to. And there we go. So there we go. Um, I hope that was a useful workflow and definitely an improved version of the last time I took on this workflow on my channel. I will be taking this script and a few other ones into a future video in PyRevit where I'll firstly look at how we can package Dynamo scripts into a toolbar format through PyRevit itself. Um, so do feel free to check out that video. It should be coming next on the channel. Um, and I look forward to continuing the PyRevit series. Um, anyway, if you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. And I look forward to seeing you in future similar videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye.